A good evening, ladies and gents. This is Denerdus the Human, and welcome to this Games Guide edition of Medieval 2 Total War. And today we're going to look at the gunpowder units and assess how we can best use them on the battlefield. I looked in the previous guide at how we can mod the guns to be more effective, but I never really discussed the battle tactics themselves. I do think a big part of the issue surrounding guns is that they require different treatment to be fully utilised on the battlefield. Musketeers are not supposed to be an upgrade on crossbows, yet the two are often compared. In reality, aside from being raged units, they are simply a completely different beast. Warfare was changing, and to utilise this new roster of units, it is necessary to create new tactics. So today we're going to address just that. Not just the late game musketeers, but also the gun cav and the large variety of cannons and other toys that come along. Firstly, let's look at why you might want to be using gunpowder weapons in your armies, which involves us understanding how weapons and defence works mechanically in total war, and trust me, the numbers are scary. Remember, guns are incredibly powerful. Projectiles render defence skill obsolete, guns ignore shields entirely, and the armour piercing will half the armour and even round down where necessary. So guns leave many units as weak as a peasant. Take this unit of chivalric knights, they have a total defence of 22, but defence skill is only for melee, so that immediately takes it down to 14 when being shot at. The shield is rendered completely obsolete due to guns, now it's down to simply the 8 armour, but because of armour piercing that is halved, so the dismounted chivalric knights only actually have 4 defence when being shot down by my camel gunners. The Chivalric Knights are of course one of the most well armoured units going, so for everyone else this is looking very dire indeed. For the Volgier over here they have 5 armour, after halving this is actually rounded down to 2. So their defence against gun projectiles is as low as 2. Get that in your head for a minute because these camel gunners are going to have a gloriously good time, especially if on camelback they can keep on running away from the infantry. The power of these guns is the key reason that in the late era you see more and more units like this, the Scots Guard, who don't have a shield at all. We also have the Lancers back here, who likewise have decided to give up their shield. They are increasingly redundant, and the late era units begin to represent that. Guns were very gradually changing the face of the battlefield. Let's take a look at the basic footmen, handgunners, arquebusiers, and musketeers. A couple general points on their fiddliness as we start. Firstly, gunners do not shoot if they might cause friendly fire, so you will need to give them a clear shot. Secondly, they often have men not shooting if they aren't in two ranks. The third or fourth rank won't really be involved at all. Thirdly, they generally want to face their target straight on or they won't shoot, which leads to the turning and twisting mechanism. Now, unfortunately, Needing to face their target makes standing in ranks of two even more awkward unless they are front and centre. It is probably worth being in ranks of three or four if it means they don't do the shuffle and keep shooting, but it all depends on the situation I suppose. Let's begin with the handgunners then, who are the earliest gun soldier available? Now I'm always excited to use them as they do look rather badass, but sadly they are rather fiddly to use with their very short range in their skirmish mode to often activate before they've even had a chance to shoot. As a general rule, gunpowder units don't really like shooting their own friends. If you can get them round the side into a nice clean shot, yeah, see, they'll suddenly start shooting and they have routed straight away. So these can be quite effective, but they're not really to be used how you might have anticipated. There's no one there anymore, mate. Yeah, they're not really used how you might well anticipate. They're actually very, very good at being like infantry, getting round and flanking them. In fact, if you look at their stats, they're actually pretty strong in terms of a melee, so you can uh, yeah, loosen them up, charge in to finish them off. Arquebusiers and musketeers are essentially the same mechanically, but the musketeer is a big improvement. They can be recruited from the barracks in your cities, although the Cossacks have the advantage of coming from any huge city. Speaking of which, the Russian Cossack musketeers and the Turkish Janissary musketeers are far superior to the standard model, with higher melee capabilities, stronger missile power, and a huge 11 morale compared to the usual three. As for using them in battle, both arquebusiers and musketeers rely on a clear line of sight, so they must either be elevated or sit at the front of your lines. If you have a lovely hill behind you, then fabulous. 
You can happily accommodate as many of these chaps as you like, but if they have to sit at the front of your lines, then it makes sense that people question their utility, as they are generally very poor in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Personally, I believe it is well worth placing musketeers at the front. Compared to the Archbishops, they have added power and exceptional range, which makes them incredibly effective. Just watch them slaughter this unit of chivalric knights as they approach. Of course, the issue then becomes melee, but there are a few options here. Number one, you can put them in skirmish mode so they retreat behind the infantry. Assuming cavalry support keeps you safe, they can then flank and slaughter the enemy with all their morale debuffs. Number two, pike and shot. Using pikes to cover your musketeers is a sensible option. This can work with any infantry type, but pikes obviously are useful for holding a line, which allows your muskets the time to potentially redeploy in high ground or as those risky flankers again. Number three, sharpened stakes. Now the Turks have the best of both worlds here. They can use the stakes in front of the musketeers with heavy infantry in behind. Oh, it is a magnificent combo. Cavalry are prevented from taking out the musketeers. Infantry charges are slowed down by the spikes, which allows you to micromanage your retreat that little bit closer to the line and thus get more shots into the enemy. And four, muskets are clearly best to skirmish at the start of battle or shoot the rear lines from an elevated position. But remember, they are also exceptional at shooting down retreating units, so they have their use at the battle's end too. The Archibusiers sadly are stuck in the middle. Their range isn't imperious like musketeers, so they take damage from other missile troops without being able to return fire. But their range also means that they can't get many volleys off before the enemy crashes into your front line. Now, personally, I think Archibusiers are best kept elevated behind the lines where they can cause significant damage to incoming infantry. If you can't find a spot to elevate them, then either don't use them or flank with them like the hand gunners. Sadly, their lack of range and weak melee means they sit awkwardly in the middle and are ultimately very situational. It is worth bearing in mind that whilst Poland and England don't get musketeers, they can utilise marker bushes more effectively than most as they can deploy stakes with their bowmen just like the Turks. These are probably the only factions I would consider though using archibushes in the front lines. In summary, ideally you always want your gunmen in an elevated rear position, if at all possible. If not, then consider the composition of your army carefully. Can you deploy pike and shot tactics? Can you guard using sharpened stakes? Do you have the cavalry superiority to allow them to flank safely after the skirmish stage? Ultimately, I think musketeers are very strong, and providing you consider how to best use them, they will serve you very well indeed. With the footmen covered then, let's move on to the cavalry and oh, they are an awful lot of fun. Cavalry gunmen like Raitas, Kamal Gunners or the Apache mounted Thunder Braves work differently to the footmen. They can all shoot at once and are elevated, so they can provide excellent support over your infantry and shoot into their line helping to turn a losing infantry conflict into a victorious one. And naturally, their manoeuvrability mixed in with high missile attack is terrifying. These units are insanely powerful. Now, both examples from the main game are excellent if balanced differently. The Camel Gunners get little love and yet are one of the best units in the whole game. They have superior range to their German counterparts, and should they get caught out, the added bonus of scaring horses does help in the hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bear in mind that by this era, most cav is heavy and slow. The camels can match them easily, leaving any knights foolhardy enough to chase them shot to ribbons. Obviously the Reitas are more heavily armed and armoured, however their range is much shorter. But this doesn't really pose a problem though, as they are very fast and manoeuvrable. The mounted Thunder Braves are possibly the most striking of all. The Apaches gain access to these after defeating cavalry and gunpowder units at least 10 times. Their scarcity makes them all the more enjoyable. They may have no armour at all, but they are fast moving with good stamina and long range muskets. These cav are lighter than anything the French or English can bring, so they'll dance their way to victory. Just be wary of the Spanish Dragoons who, whilst being short on numbers, can easily defeat you with their superior weapons and armour. On the Britannia DLC you may come across the Irish mounted Calitherman who stats sit in the middle of the Apache and German equivalents. Their range, to be honest, isn't all that great. They're a bit close range like the Germans, and they lack the shooting circle, but they're still pretty excellent, and the only gun cav in the entire DLC. 
The final mounted gunners are the Elephant Musketeers, which of course you can use to skirmish and route units like the Chivalric Knights here, but when you get bored they are elephants of course, so let the madness ensue. I don't think I really need to say any more, the pictures tell their own story. Overall then, gunpowder cavalry units excel at skirmishes and the manoeuvrability likens them to Scythian horse archers in Rome, constantly harassing the enemy. Except these units come with a bonus of gunpowder weapons so the enemies simply melt like Swiss cheese. Suffice to say that I am a fan of these units, they're staringly strong and rather simple to use. But now let's move on to the final section, artillery. Whilst people may feel unfamiliar or lack confidence using musketmen or gun cav, I suspect we all feel confident in using cannons to smash down walls. But of course, whilst we have those kind of cannons, there are a few more exotic types too. Let's have a look at all these in a few different groups. Starting with the wall demolishers. We begin with the bombard, of course. We get a first taste of demolishing enemy walls around turn 110, and oh, does it feel good. However, these are but the basic model. When it comes to huge stone walls or castles, your ammo will run out quickly. They aren't simply good enough. Naturally, we upgrade to the Grand Bombard, the Cannon, and if you're the Turks or Highland Mercs, you can get the daddy of them all, the Monster Bombard. All these are pretty straightforward. Shoot at the walls. They are, of course, pretty useless at taking out units effectively, unless, of course, the AI just stands around as target practice, which it does quite like to do. Nonetheless, these are pretty simple, so let's move on to the troop slayers, shall we? The Serpentine is a piece of majesty that really signals the movement towards artillery-dominated battlefields in the centuries to come. These do little damage to buildings, but they were never really meant to. These are solely meant to take out the soldiers. Best in the open field, their quick reload makes them ideal for taking out clumped enemies, strong units like generals, elephants, or even enemy artillery, as they are about as accurate as a cannon can get. Don't forget that their missiles can impale multiple men. Gosh, these guys are deliciously brutal. The Ribolt and its big brother the Monster Ribolt are the madmen of the gunpowder family, choosing chaos and anarchy over all else. It is tempting to plunk these at the front of your lines, but even with an open goal like this canyon scenario, they generally only get off one volley before getting charged. Their range simply isn't good enough. However, they are excellent for taking out elephants. They can be useful when defending tight streets, or if you can pull it off, they are brutal after sneaking around the side of pitched combat to unleash a large-scale morale debuff. Sadly though, they mostly disappoint. The Mongol rocket launcher, however, is an entirely different animal. It is everything the Ribolt promises to be, with more power, range and pizzazz. Unlike the Ribolt, the rocket launcher actually pulls it off. Not all elephants fear the Ribolt though, some have embraced its madness to create the most insane unit of them all, the mercenary elephant rocketeers. Utter cocking madness, need I say any more. Finally we come to the all-rounders, beginning with the Culverine and its stronger companion, the formidable Basilisk. Both are at home on just about any battlefield, being able to shoot down enemy troops with ease and smash walls with no problem. Carrying both standard and exploding rounds, and with better range than its competitors, the Basilisk is true the king of artillery. Beware its glistening gaze. The Mortar is a strange but wonderful beast. It specialises in sieges, both offensive and defensive. In defensive, they can hit clumped enemies at various choke points, and can take out siege equipment pretty effectively. When attacking, they can help crack down the walls if need be, but vitally, they can weaken clumped enemies hiding behind the walls, particularly helpful when the enemy retreat towards the plaza. Finally, we reach the last unit, the Artillery Elephants, and sure, this Sicilian army has made terrible, terrible choices and tactics, but gosh, are these units just immense. It's an absolute slaughter. And do bear in mind, having Elephant Artillery is particularly brutal on the campaign map, as Elephants have significantly more movement points than most Artillery units, so they can reach cities far further afield for that surprise one turn attack. That's all for now then ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me on this merry romp through the world of gunpowder units, and suffice to say that this video took on a life of its own and the sheer amount of footage recorded was utterly insane, but hopefully you found this helpful or at the very least interesting. I definitely think people need to have a better appreciation of gunpowder units 
I certainly have in the making of this video. So hopefully this will inspire you to give them a closer look on your next campaign. Let me know your favourite of these units below and I will see you next time. But for now I will leave you. I'm Thomas, this is Tenetus the Human and this has been a guide to gunpowder units in Medieval 2 Total War. Thank you and bye bye. Today we're going to go for particularly aggressive diplomacy. Oh, oh yes, it worked. Kablamo! <laughs> you are always going to die, Steve. Oh, my feudal knights! My crispy, crispy feudal knights! The ram's burning! <laughs> right at the death!